Hi, welcome to Macaulay at Macaulay Author Series. My name is Charmaine Ludlow. And on behalf of Dean Mary Pearl and the whole Macaulay community, we'd like to thank you for taking this time out to spend with us. Tonight, we'll have two special guests with us. We have Asha Okabe, who was one of our alums from the class of 2007. And we also have with us tonight, who will be moderating Casey Johnson. He's a professor of history at Brooklyn College. Um, Tonight, um, we'll have some questions at the end of the program, and you'll be able to post your questions at the Q&A um, button at the, at the end of the screen. Thank you both for being with us tonight. Welcome, Asha, and welcome, Casey. Charmaine, thank you very much. Thank, thanks to all of you who are who are with us virtually. It's it's always a uh, a treat. Um, uh, I, I should say that Asher was either the first or the second um, Macaulay student that I ever got to uh, teach, and I, I I taught him back when this was the CUNY Honors College. And it's hard to imagine now, but there there was a time when there was some faculty resistance to Chancellor Goldstein's vision of uh, of an honors college, which never quite made sense to uh, to me. I thought it would be good to have good students come into uh, to CUNY, but to the extent there ever was a concern, Asher's uh, career would would be the the model to to resist it. He was he was just an extraordinary student, someone who elevated the 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 quality of uh, of, of all of his uh, classes, but also an active participant in campus culture. Someone who really kind of you know there the, the were. There were very few things that uh, that were, were not a positive with with his experience, and so I think you know, since I, I, I I've taught Asher, I've probably had between eighty and hundred other Macaulay students. I've taught a couple of Macaulay seminars as uh, as well, and while you know students of Asher's quality don't come along very often in an academic's uh, career, my experience with Macaulay has been overwhelmingly uh, positive. And so, you know, I'd like to, to thank Charmaine and all of the staff and administrators at Macaulay. I mean, people like me are just along for the ride, getting all of these these wonderful students that you're recruiting to uh, to CUNY to to sort of help help us out. So, you know, I'm I'm very grateful. And I'm uh, uh, touched that I was uh, asked to uh, to address uh, uh, this uh, this session. Um, so Asher, after a, a stellar career at Brooklyn, went on uh, uh, to Harvard, where where he got his PhD in, in Middle East history. And you know, I uh, I was part of the, the the department a generation before Asher, and I think one of the key aspects of uh, of the department was a commitment to international history and to approaching complex problems through an international lens. And Asher's career is certainly a representative of uh, of that. Um, he uh, his his first book, which is which is simply a, a extraordinary work of history, um, uh, was published by Oxford called Beyond the Arab Cold War: The International History of the Yemen Civil War, uh, from 1962 until 1968. Um, and this is a model of uh, of a book that takes a a a complex and difficult topic, um, approaches it through imaginative uh, lenses, and also just from the standpoint of historians, was able to, to, to complete, I think, a really quite sophisticated international history in a topic for which uh, archival uh, source material could be both uh, sporadic in terms of uh, uh, quality, but also sporadic in terms of uh, in terms of access. Um, the book that we're talking about uh, this evening uh, is newly published, also from Oxford, uh, entitled "What Everyone Needs to Know About uh, About Yemen." Um, Asher has uh, occupied a number of positions since leaving Harvard. He's currently an associate research scholar uh, at Princeton uh, University. He is someone who is moving comfortably between uh, the, the the realm. Of the academy, of policy, uh, and of uh, of media, um, and I think it's a real treat for uh, for all of us to uh, to get to uh, hear from him uh, tonight. So our format is going to be that Asher will will speak some uh, about the book. I'll ask him a few questions. You you can and should feel free to uh, to leave questions in the Q and A or in the chat as we move along. Uh, and I'll ask the questions um, at uh, at the end of the uh, the session. Uh, and with that, uh, Asher, you have the floor. Uh, Professor Johnson and, and Macaulay, really thank you for for hosting this uh, to Charmaine and. It all started in, in Brooklyn College, as they say, uh, inspired by courses. I feel like I'm, it was just yesterday we were sitting in our course together, uh, getting inspired by a deep dive into intellectual history. 
And that's really what inspired a lot of uh, my own career. So it's really special for me to be here at this stage as uh, mid-career, looking back to those early days in Brooklyn College with uh, Professor Johnson and uh, also great thanks to Macaulay for making all that possible. Uh, so uh, I um, share my uh, screen here uh, and uh, just start with, uh, with something that's, that's really a bit of an ambitious title of Yemen, what everyone needs to know. Uh, the nice part about being part of a series is that you don't really have control over the topic. So uh, it is uh, somewhat ambitious, but uh, so is the series in and of itself. Uh, so I wanted to start off with something unusual. Uh, and this was back in, in 2018, and I was watching an episode of Full Frontal uh, by comedian Samantha B, uh, who was sitting down over beers with, uh, as part of the episode uh, with Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy to discuss the crisis in Yemen uh, at the time in 2018. Uh, Seemingly uh, not necessarily something you would find in a uh, front uh, and center of a comedy show, uh, but actually this, uh, upon watching this episode, I had a, a bit of a realization. I just wanted to share a very brief clip here. Most Americans don't know much at all about Yemen. The only thing Americans really know about Yemen is that Chandler pretended to move to Yemen in order to break up with Janice. Janice was terrible. Fair. Though not as terrible as trying to explain the war in Yemen on a comedy show. Uh, so this piece, uh, and, and this uh, I probably replayed it in my head a hundred times, uh, it was the realization to me that the American pu public really knew and still knows very little about Yemen, uh, not just uh, in the recent conflict, uh, but in earlier decades, uh, Yemen was something that most Americans and, and even most public policy professionals could not find in a map. And despite the ongoing civil war, most Americans, as Samantha B. clearly says, uh, associate Janice from Friends with Yemen and Chandler rather than the war itself. Uh, so uh, then uh, emerges uh, Oxford University Press and a really great series of what everyone needs to know. It's uh, their effort to bridge the gap between the academia and the academic experts in public policy. Uh, there are uh, tons of uh, dozens of these books uh, written by leading authorities and they're given fields that offer these balanced and authoritative uh, primers to complex uh, current event issues and, and countries. And it's a concise question and answer format. And I saw that as ideal for really answering the precise questions that I saw come up in media and public policy spheres. Uh, what was everyone asking uh, and how could I address that in some ways in a book uh, that's less than 200 pages uh, to cover everything that uh, one would want to know about Yemen uh, in this question answer format. Uh, so I, I began by first looking at, at the most uh, visible images or the things that everyone was looking at uh, regarding Yemen. And the most visible image was the humanitarian crisis. Uh, so for the past five years, uh, images such as uh, starving children and diseased children uh, and uh, uh, crisis in Yemen, uh, large numbers of uh, both uh, starvation, uh, that Yemen was constantly on the brinks of starvation. This is all part of this narrative of the, the humanitarian disaster. And the number one question is, how did this happen? Right, so in the book, I, I try to explain that uh, obviously it was not caused by a natural disaster. This was a man-made humanitarian disaster. Uh, and what's considered by most uh, experts as the largest man-made humanitarian disaster in history. Uh, I'm not sure what metrics they were using, but uh, in any event, uh, that's that's the title that's given to Yemen. But it was uh, this famine uh, and uh, medical crisis across Yemen was caused uh, in part by a blockade carried out by Saudi Arabia on Yemen. Uh, millions of internally displaced persons across the country, uh, active fighting in the streets of the major cities of, of Yemen and in between the urban areas widespread corruption across government agencies, warring parties. Uh, and lastly, what is most alarming, at least to me, and, and I express that in the book, is the growing national dependence upon humanitarian aid to the detriment of many of the local Yemenis and a lot of what they're trying to achieve in, in sustainability. So this dire, uh, what, what I would also add to that is the fact that this dire humanitarian situation in Yemen is not solely a consequence of war violence, but it's really a culmination of decades long uh, resource and infrastructure mismanagement and neglect. It's not something that happened overnight in Yemen, but it's something that has been on the precipice for the past several decades and has really come to a fore with this major uh, 
crisis. The second most prevalent question and image that is related to the Yemen conflict uh, and, and to Yemen more generally is the Houthi movement and the Houthi rebels in particular. And their now infamous slogan, which you can see written here in, in Arabic, Allahu Akbar al-Mawt al-Amrika al-Mawt Israel Allah na'ala al-Yahud al-Nasr al-Islam, translated to God is great, death to America, death to Israel, cursed be the Jews, victory to Islam. This is ubiquitous across Yemen uh, and it's spread even beyond the borders of Yemen. Uh, has its origins in the 1979 Iranian revolution, but has taken off like wildfire across Yemen is the platform of the Houthi rebel movement in this infamous slogan. So the question that is asked, uh, uh, the humanitarian disaster was the first one. The second one is where do these Houthis come from? Uh, and in answering that, uh, it's uh, both important to see the, the current, uh, where they came from in the short term, but as a historian, you always need to look long-term. Uh, so uh, first the Houthis show up uh, on the major screen in 2014 as they seize the capital city of Sana'a, uh, ousting the sitting government and replacing it with a racist regime that adheres to very strict religious principles and an extremist political ideology. But in reality, this group uh, did not appear from nowhere, but really is a group of disgruntled Northern tribesmen who've been marginalized for several decades of Yemen's history recently. Uh, and who managed through uh, both uh, these populist slogans uh, and through uh, militant and political maneuvering to unite disparate anti-government opposition groups, both in the north and central of the country to overthrow the Yemeni Republic. And policy analysts, uh, and in fact, uh, media folks, even Samantha B herself, if uh, we watched the rest of her episode on Yemen, divide the country into two spheres. There were the, there's the Houthi rebels, uh, as you see here on the left-hand side of the screen, allied with Iran, and the remnants of the Yemeni Republic, plus uh, various different groups of other Yemenis allied with the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. This oversimplification of, of the conflict, and I think especially US media likes to oversimplify things. An entire half of the 20th century was oversimplified as the Cold War, where every part of the world is divided into the United States and the Soviet Union. Something similar was done in the Middle East in the Arab Cold War, which was the topic of uh, my, my first book, dividing the Middle East into spheres of Saudi and Egyptian influence. Some very uh, similar oversimplification is happening in the Middle East today, where uh, especially US-based media companies are dividing the Middle East into the Saudi and Iran umbrellas. Uh, and this oversimplification and creating a uh, out of the Yemen conflict, this Saudi-Iranian proxy war really diminishes a lot of the Yemeni agency in their own history, their own politics. And this oversimplification fails to understand the Yemeni origins of the conflict uh, and uh, also uh, fails to take into account the Yemeni solutions that need to come uh, in order to solve this conflict for the long term. And that's really what my uh, book tries to do. Uh, starting the conversation far earlier than the beginning of this conflict in 2014 uh, and looking more into what Yemen is, how it became what it is, uh, and, and how can we understand the country today. Uh, now, most uh, of the current policy books uh, and analysts and histories even begin an analysis of Yemen with the presidency of Ali Abdullah Saleh, the 33-year presidency of uh, Saleh, who resigned in 2012 after the Arab Spring protests, leading to a political crisis that metastasized into a costly civil war, uh, the ramifications of which we see today. Uh, and uh, Saleh was killed by his own machinations in December of 2017, marking an end to a very defining presidency within Yemen's history, uh, but also uh, a very limited uh, window. 33 years into uh, the history doesn't give us the full story of, of what exactly is happening in Yemen today. Uh, so my book uh, begins not in the 1970s, but actually centuries earlier to when Yemen was not the center of either terrorism or the center of global unrest, uh, but rather the central center of global commerce and political power. Uh, one would really have to go back to the Queen of Sheba uh, and Yemen of antiquity, uh, which is where my book begins, looking at a period of time uh, 
uh, 10th century BCE, when Yemen was the spice capital of the world. Uh, and in more recent centuries, Yemen claims to be the birth, birthplace of coffee, although that's often a hotly debated point between Yemen and Ethiopia. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, Yemen's coffee beans uh, reached worldwide cafes through the Yemeni port of Mocha, thus giving us the coffee flavor of Mocha that you might find in your regular Starbucks or Pete's Place menu. Uh, and in fact, Yemeni coffee remains one of the most exotic and expensive varieties of San Francisco specialty coffee scene. Uh, and you can see here just one example of, uh, of what you can find, San Francisco, California, Yemen mocha, exotic malty and chocolate. Uh, but yet this uh, belies what is a very long history of uh, Yemeni agriculture, uh, a long history of the country's uh, spices, uh, coffee. And uh, it's not for no reason that Yemen was called the Arabia Felix or Happy Arabia because of its uh, agricultural empire, its ability to uh, grow and feed uh, populations to grow specialty items, especially uh, spices and, uh, and coffee, uh, which then makes one wonder how far the country has fallen, where the agricultural capital of the Arabian Peninsula can no longer feed its own population and is on the brink of starvation. Uh, understanding this then is uh, understanding the lack of infrastructure, uh, the corruption, uh, and the movement from uh, Yemeni economy away from a subsistence economy to one that really focuses on uh, cash crops. Uh, and, and the book explains how this crisis emerges, not just because of a war, but because of decades of mismanagement uh, lead what was the agricultural capital of the Arabian Peninsula to uh, the brink of starvation. Uh, similarly, uh, the southern Yemeni port city of Aden or Aden uh, was one of the world's largest natural harbors uh, by some metrics, second only to New York City in the scope and, and largesse of its natural harbor. It was once the center of the medieval Indian Ocean trade, uh, and then in later decades uh, during the mid-19th century became a hub for the British Imperial Navy for over 150 years, and uh, has since suffered a uh, precipitous decline in the second half of the 20th century, but the revitalization of Aden as a port city has been the favorite post-war economic project for a lot of foreign investors. Many have pointed to the southern Yemeni port city of Aden as uh, the new revitalization of, of Yemen. The economic prosperity of Yemen is going to be intertwined uh, with Aden. Uh, unfortunately, this trope for the past 40 years uh, that Aden is going to be the center of Yemeni economic revitalization forgot to take into account the fact that uh, Jeddah, the Saudi port along the Red Sea has also had its own economic revitalization and can handle far more shipping than the port city of Aden, as can Djibouti, as can uh, numerous Somali ports that have been constructed in recent years. Uh, so Aden is now entering a very crowded Red Sea port market, uh, certainly not something that it was used to during the mid 19th to the mid 20th centuries. Uh, now, while uh, Ancient history, coffee, and, and Aden are most noticeably Yemeni. The country is really famous for its language and its poetry. Here's an image of one of Yemen's youngest poets, uh, or youngest well-known poets, and uh, Rim al-Shamiri reciting poetry in Sana'a. And in a country where even a public bus ride in, in traffic can be the scene of poetry recitations, uh, what else would someone do during a very uh, significant uh, traffic jam other than recite poetry to a bus filled of eager Yemenis. Uh, it was fitting that each chapter in my book opens with a translated verse of Yemeni poetry. Some of the most beautiful verses and poems uh, that I've experienced in the world come from Yemen where every city has uh, not just a mayor but a, uh, a central poet. There's a poet to every city every presidential administration, every politician has a poet uh, that they will contract out to to write poetry, uh, to recite poetry at every national meeting, uh, where poetry becomes the language of Yemen, uh, especially in a country where the literacy rate is very low. Poetry is recited and memorized uh, orally and is really an expression both of political identity, of regional identity, uh, and also more generally of, of Yemeni identity. So while ancient history, culture, coffee, 
uh, economic potential and, and poetry are all fascinating in, in their own right and certainly uh, were a lot of fun to write about. Uh, but why would the general public care about Yemen? Which is the main question is uh, why Yemen? Uh, and the answer to this question lies uh, uh, in Yemen's geography, specifically in two areas. Uh, one is the Bab al Mandeb Strait. And the Bab al Mandeb Strait is uh, the entrance, uh, you could see here in this map, the entrance to the Red Sea uh, and the ultimate entrance to the Suez Canal. Bab al Mandeb is only 29 kilometers wide, its narrowest point, but yet it's the fourth busiest waterway in the world. It connects the Mediterranean with the Indian Ocean via the Red Sea. And it's a vital waterway that connects Asia and Europe to massive markets uh, and leads directly to the Suez Canal, which hosts 33,000 ships per year and 6,500 oil tankers. And that, uh, for those of you keeping track, that's about 7% of the world's daily oil supply. Uh, as we saw just a few weeks ago, uh, it seems like months ago, uh, like years ago, uh, but where a single container ship blocked the Suez Canal for less than a week, but yet cost billions of dollars in lost shipping fees and in expenses by the Egyptian government. The potential for long-term instability and violence on the Yemeni shores of Bab al-Mandab could have far more costly economic and, and political consequences uh, to the Suez Canal dependent shipping. Uh, so where one week could have billions of dollars in costs, long-term years of instability in Yemen could have trillions of dollars in costs if ships can't make their way through Bab al-Mandab without fearing attack from either side, uh, it would make the threat from Somali pirates seem insignificant. Uh, and that's certainly what's on the mind of many uh, of uh, the uh, US-based European uh, and, uh, Euro and uh, Asian uh, markets as they're looking at the conflict in Yemen. The focus is really on Bab al-Mandab. Uh, the second piece uh, is Yemen's position just south of Saudi Arabia where Yemen shares an 1100 mile border with Saudi Arabia and Yemen, and where most of the public attention in the US focuses on the US-Mexico border, few people realize that Saudi Arabia is constructing a far larger, uh, more significant rather, uh, border along their southern border between uh, Yemen and Saudi Arabia uh, that specifically focuses on three disputed territories between the two countries, highlighted here of Asir, Najran, and Jizan. And uh, 130 years in, in history in the Arabian Peninsula is a relatively short period of time, uh, where these three uh, territories, these three provinces, are seized by Saudi Arabia during the 1930s and remain a point of contention between the two countries. Numerous Yemeni governments and multiple movements across the country's history have demanded the return of three Yemeni provinces, at least as they're seen in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but this southern border conflict uh, is just one part of what is a, a much larger Saudi concern over southern border security. Saudis fear Yemeni that Yemeni instability will cross the border and undermine uh, the Saudi government, which could have major ramifications for Middle East stability and, and oil supply. My favorite quote from uh, one of the Saudis who had been visiting the Kennedy School, uh, and I asked him, what keeps you up at night? What's your biggest nightmare? And he tells me, there's not one nightmare, but there's 29 million nightmares, and they're called Yemenis. And this is really the Saudi vision, uh, that Saudi, the Saudi monarchy, the Saudi largesse, the Saudi uh, oil wealth, uh, is all dependent upon border security and border stability. And instability within Yemen has the potential to spill over uh, into Saudi Arabia and undermine Saudi stability and undermine the monarchy and, and throw the entire Arabian Peninsula into a great deal of uh, anarchy. Uh, and uh, it's with these two last ideas in, in mind that uh, I'll, I'll leave us with uh, one of my favorite photos from uh, Yemen. That's Bab al-Yemen, or literally the doors of Yemen. Uh, this majestic market is the largest and busiest market in the Arabian Peninsula where 
Yemenis and foreigners can come and buy everything from the famous Yemeni spices to Chinese made plastic sandals. And it's open to tens of thousands of shoppers uh, every day. Uh, and similarly, I'd like to open the floor to uh, questions uh, very befitting to the what everyone needs to know, which is a question answer format. Uh, I'm happy to answer similarly any questions and answers uh, that uh, any anyone has uh, from the audience. So thank you for your time and I look forward to uh, hearing your thoughts. Asher, thank you very much. Uh, it, the, the chat is open, so is the Q&A panel. So for those of you who have questions, please uh, leave them through one of those two uh, buttons. I'll be, uh, I'll be, I'll be monitoring. Um, I thought we could start with just a general question uh, of, you know, I think that applies to sort of any author. Uh, how, how has the book been received uh, so far? Uh, so the highlight of my year was receiving a WhatsApp message uh, from someone high up in the State Department who was on their way over to Yemen, uh, sitting on the plane with a picture of my book next to himself and a number of other uh, the dignitaries saying, guess what we're reading on the airplane. Uh, so that was a real vote of confidence, both for the work that uh, I've done and uh, and also the fact that uh, it's, it's really... Uh, being received in that way. And uh, that was the whole goal in, in sitting and writing this book, because uh, one can write a book and it's uh, an echo chamber. It's uh, within your ivory tower, within the university. And, and of course, it's part of the requirements in, in the academia where we need to write those argumentative books. And that's how we advance the field. But how then do you translate all of that research and expertise to an audience beyond the university? And I think that's something we all struggle with in, in the university. How much can, how do you translate uh, those books? And on the one hand, I began when the war broke out in Yemen, everyone else was, uh, all of my other colleagues were headed over towards uh, university-based positions and tenure track positions. And, and I looked at my expertise and I looked at the war in Yemen. I said, there's no way that I can go back to a university and ignore what's happening in the world. And, and part of the challenge over the past five years has been balancing the university life and, and translating and bringing that over to uh, the public policy sphere. So uh, this this book, in, in some ways, uh, my goal was to reach that, that audience, to reach those who are out in the field and who have these questions. Uh, and the highlight of my year was seeing that not only was it reaching the audience, but it was on the airplane while they were heading over to Yemen uh, in order to make those decisions. And that's what they were reading on the flight. Uh, I, I didn't hear afterwards whether or not it put them to sleep. It may have, uh, but nevertheless, it was a long flight. So it probably would have had its benefit as well. Um, the, you, you raise here an interesting point, which is, is, is you know, the, the intersection, I think, between between good history and the desire to influence. So on the, on the one hand, of course, we, we, we want to help shape academic discourse. We want to advance academic knowledge with, with our research. On the second, the hope, I think, of, of any good historian is to be able to uh, to, to have their message spread uh, uh, spread to the public and to, and to influence you know, a somewhat broader opinion than the, the, the 30 or 40 or 50 you know, ultra special specialists in, in, in our field. And, and so with that in mind, I, I'm curious how you see um, the, the, you know, the, the role of history, and we'll talk uh, uh, in some more specific detail a bit later, but how you see the role of history more generally in helping us to, to understand uh, contemporary events in Yemen, or is this the sort of thing where, you know, where, where a Samantha Bee can sort of trot along and, you know, re read an op-ed or two and, and have enough knowledge to, to, to discuss it, uh, um, uh, you know, in, you know so, somewhat informally. I mean, essentially, d d you know, History we hope can illuminate, but but are, are there ways in which history obscures what's uh, what's going on in, in in the current environment? There was a great moment I think in answering that where uh, I was sitting and uh, I think I remember it was an MSNBC interview, and the question was asked by one of the uh, one of the moderators uh, by um, by the news anchor. Well, so can you tell us where did this conflict begin? And I paused and I said, well, I can give the 30-day answer that things really began 30 days ago. I, I can give the three-year answer, right? uh, and, and that's really where the conflict began. Uh, but then I said, well, that's not really far enough because a historian, really, we know it, it didn't begin three years ago, but, but it began 
50 years earlier or, or longer. Uh, and then I said, well, really, maybe it begins in the, mid the medieval period. And if we understand Yemen's progression as a country and then leading up to this. So as I'm thinking through how I'm, I'm going to answer this question, I, I realized that there wasn't enough time to give a, an hour and a half lecture on Yemen's history. Uh, but it was a two minute soundbite that I had. Uh, so the compromise that I reached with myself was let's begin in the 1930s. Right? And, and that's where I, I said, well, it really all began in 1933. And, and I talked about the, the long trajectory of Saudi Yemeni history. And in that, uh, I, I think that the, uh, the, the point that the, the realization that I had at that stage is that uh, history can can be in some ways a, a rabbit hole where you fall down it and you start getting really into the weeds of uh, what was said in history and, and how that's um, impacting. And that's, that's really what the field's about is we like escaping into these really great stories and narratives that you find in archives. But the real challenge is then seeing what we do as a profession in, in analyzing the 1930s can have a real impact on understanding the contemporary conflicts, where uh, the conflict between Saudi Arabia and Yemen was, was never just about the southern border, but it was really about a conflict between settled and nomadic Bedouins, as they saw it during the 1930s, where the Yemenis were settled Bedouins and, uh, and, and the, the Saudis were nomadic Bedouins. And the challenge in figuring out uh, who was far superior culturally to the other, uh, where they were coming from, uh, it was part of this this cultural debate between the two of them. So understanding those origins uh, can really help us. So in some ways, history does muddle it because you get so far into the weeds and start debating points from the 1930s without forgetting that today is a very different day. But without history, you can't make an informed decision on today. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the, the Q&A. Those of you who are in the audience and have questions, please uh, uh, feel free to, to ask them. So the, the first is after, after decades of war and with no end in sight, um, what, what do you see as, as the end game for, uh, for Saudi Arabia in, uh, in Yemen? So uh, my vision of what the Saudis had wanted has changed over the course of this war. Uh, so the Yemeni Republic, uh, Mansur Hadi was the president of, of Yemen, escapes Sana'a, escapes the capital city, dressed as a Yemeni woman, as many Yemeni politicians have done in the past uh, because they have full guys and, and uh, he, he escapes and he runs off to, to Aden uh, through uh, various different means and, and gets to the southern Yemeni port city of Aden and the Houthi tribesmen are following him. He leaves Aden and goes to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and begs the Saudis to intervene, uh, claiming that the Houthis are coming at the behest of Iran to overthrow the Yemeni government, and therefore the Saudis need to intervene. So the Saudis form a coalition, which included at the time Pakistan, Egypt, uh, numerous, uh, and the Emirates, uh, numerous other countries as well, who came together in the Saudi coalition, including the United States, uh, who provided some aerial support to the Saudi group. and the Houthi military sites were targeted. But as the Saudis discovered, as many other countries previously, is you can't win a war from the air. And at the same time, the Saudis were not willing to commit their own forces to Yemen. Uh, the Emiratis were a different story. They hired a bunch of mercenaries to run the war for them. Uh, but the Saudis were in, in a conundrum. You can't win a war from the air, uh, but you also can't prop up a, a Yemeni Republican government without legitimacy. Right, so the Saudis enter, entered this war hoping it would be a, a quick pushback of, of the Houthis. No such thing happened. And with each successive year and each successive bomb and uh, the suffering of Yemenis at the hands of the Saudi blockade that emerged in 2015, Yemenis have, have grown to uh, dislike the Yemeni Republic. And, and that's uh, a, uh, is a much stronger word that can be used, but there's a great deal of disdain for the Yemeni Republic that's situated in Riyadh. Uh, and the Saudis are backing a dead horse, essentially, while the rest of Yemen uh, has moved on to uh, other warlords and other leaders. So what do the Saudis want from this conflict? Uh, so I think number one is the southern border security. If the Saudis can find a way to have an ally in Yemen and maintain a weak, centrally weak Yemeni government that can still maintain southern border security, then they've succeeded. And the Saudis can leave this conflict and say, we've won. Uh, and that's an, uh, especially underscored by the fact that the Houthis declared uh, we're going to invade Saudi Arabia next once we finish with Yemen. Uh, the Saudis didn't take this threat lightly. Uh, 
The second piece, which has only emerged recently, uh, and you can follow the construction of this pipeline along Yemen's eastern border with Oman, is uh, something that the Saudis had wanted for a long time, was, which was uh, to seize Yemeni territory or, or rent Yemeni territory in order to construct a pipeline from the Saudi oil fields down into the southern Yemeni region uh, to construct an oil refinery uh, in Ras al Yusuf on Yemen's southern uh, coast. Uh, and in as such, obviate any need for the Strait of Hormuz. Now, the Strait of Hormuz is the body of water in between Saudi Arabia and Yemen uh, and Iran. It's one of the most contentious waterways where the great majority of Saudi oil is flowing. And uh, the Saudis, at least in these grand visions, thought that constructing a pipeline down to the southern Yemeni port would be one way to export oil without having to ship it via the border with Iran. Uh, and uh, Multiple negotiations over the past 30 years have been conducted between Saudi Arabia and Yemen, trying to lease this territory of 20 square kilometers along Yemen's southern border. Uh, but uh, all the negotiations fell apart. So the Saudis, at some point during this conflict, saw this as an opportunity to seize that land and that territory and construct this pipeline. Uh, and if uh, the, the pipeline continues as such, a matter of months, the Saudis could have this pipeline, declare victory, say this was the goal all along, uh, and withdraw while saving face, uh, another potential uh, avenue. So uh, the Saudis have really emerged in this conflict, originally supporting a Yemeni ally, uh, but really concerned about southern border security. And now in, in the recent years have been constructing this pipeline that they see as part of their long-term vision for the security of their oil supply. You, you mentioned in, in, in your discussion, the, the, the conversation with the, with the uh, uh, Saudi uh, uh, official who said, you know, his great fear was the 29 million uh, Yemenis and, and this fear of, of Yemeni instability threatening, uh, threatening Saudi Arabia. To, to, to what extent is, is this a case where, where Saudi policy has caused the very problem that, that they hoped to, uh, to avoid? Is this a situation in which Saudi intervention basically has created the problem? Them, or if we lived in a different world in which there had been no Saudi intervention at all in, in Yemen over the last, again, we can pick a year, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, um, the, the situation, while it may not be good from the Saudi perspective, would, would, would somewhat, somewhat be better. I mean, how, what is your evaluation of the, of the Saudi legacy in terms of creating or intensifying Yemeni in, uh, political instability? So the Saudis began this conflict concerned about Iran. Uh, and that's something I didn't mention uh, before. How, how closely was Iran really allied with the Houthis? Uh, and uh, prior to 2014, the Houthis were a tribal rebel movement. They fought a number of small battle campaigns, six campaigns against the Yemeni government. Uh, and they were relatively regional or localized problem. Uh, after Ali Abdullah Saleh, the former Yemeni president, resigns, uh, the country implodes politically. And the Houthis see this as an opportunity to begin to expand. At this point, uh, the Iranian influence is, is minimal, if anything. Uh, and in, in fact, the greater influences uh, from Hezbollah in Lebanon, who takes a great interest in the Houthis. Uh, and if uh, one were to visit Beirut and go see the Hezbollah television network in the same exact building will be the Houthi television network. They, they share television studios, they share equipment, and they also share a model of propaganda. So the Houthi movement was modeled after Hezbollah in Lebanon, it was modeled after this, uh, yes, it is an Iranian proxy Hezbollah, but it's modeled after, uh, very, very much after Hezbollah. If, if you look at the speeches that are given by the leaders of, of the Houthi movement, it's very much modeled after Hassan Nasrallah and and Hezbollah, and this uh, is is how they've structured their their tribal network. This is how they structure their political relations campaign, and they've been very successful, both Hezbollah and and uh, the Houthis. Uh, so, in order to understand the Saudis intervening, then uh, only fed the flames of this uh, Iranian concern. Uh, after 2015, as the Houthis began to have more success, the Iranians were increasingly involved in the conflict uh, with the ability to support uh, the Houthis monetarily through aid of arms politically uh, without uh, worrying about the ramifications. So in some ways, the Saudis intervening uh, out of concern for the instability in the Iranian connection 
with the Houthis ended up feeding this uh, problem and making it far worse uh, to the point where today Iran is far more involved in Yemen than it had been prior to the Saudi intervention in 2015. So the Saudis tried to achieve a, a, a modem of stability, but ended up inflaming the fire and increasing the popularity uh, and Iranian connection with the Houthis, something certainly that was not intentional. Thank you. Uh, a second question from the uh, from the audience. Uh, general question: uh, wh What is the U.S. position on the conflict with Yemen and uh, and Saudi Arabia? Uh, so the U.S. position has changed, uh, and the reason it's it's changed uh, is specifically surrounding the stance towards both the Houthis and uh, towards the Saudis. Uh, so, uh, beginning already in 2015, uh, the United States came down very strongly in support of the Saudis. The Houthi regime is openly racist, calling for the death of America. It was not a very difficult policy decision to come out openly in support of the Saudi coalition's air campaign against the Houthis, especially considering the very strong anti-American stance that the Houthis espoused. The 2018 killing of Jamal Khashoggi, who was a Saudi journalist of of a wide variety of backgrounds, uh, end up bringing US po public attention away from, uh, or support away from Saudi Arabia and uh, was seen as a, a, a turning point in US relations towards the, uh, towards the, the Saudis. Uh, it's the irony that tens of thousands uh, of Yemenis are, are killed or, or hundreds of thousands are displaced by Saudi Arabia, but a single person suffers at the hands of Saudi Arabia, and this increases uh, the uh, ire of, of the US public and the US media against Saudi Arabia. Uh, so it, in some ways, uh, some lives are, are more uh, noticeable that, than others. And that's been the, the real tragedy of Yemen, that uh, it, it's been the silent killer where tens of hundreds of thousands of Yemenis are suffering, millions are on the brink of starvation, uh, but that doesn't make it to the media. Uh, but but a single uh, event within Saudi Arabia, within the Saudi embassy, uh, makes it to the media. So, uh, but that's uh, an aside. So I think that uh, U.S. policy then began to shift against Saudi Arabia already beginning in 2018. Uh, before the end of the Trump administration, the Houthi rebels were declared a terrorist organization. Uh, and that was done for a number of reasons, uh, including uh, putting stops on the funding that could be sent to the, the Houthis because a lot of that money was going towards warlords to uh, support their war effort rather than actually to, to fund humanitarian agencies. So there was a, a degree of legitimacy in that. Uh, but one of the first things that the new administration did uh, was rescind that terrorist designation. Uh, and the uh, in, and uh, at the same time, also uh, take back a lot of the support that the United States had given for the Saudi air campaign. The the campaign was causing, in some ways, this humanitarian crisis in part. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, public resentment for that intervention. Uh, so there's a rift now between the United States and, and Saudi Arabia, specifically around the Yemeni policy. The Houthis took this change of, of US policy as a victory. Uh, many of them were celebrating in the streets of Sana'a, uh, that the Houthis have finally defeated the great Satan in the United States. Uh, and the Houthis have taken a, a major offensive towards the Eastern regions of, of Yemen that had previously been a zone of stability, an area of Marib, where Yemen has a, a small amount of oil uh, and have moved the offensive towards that direction uh, and uh, expanded the offensive. So in some ways uh, that uh, change in policy has inflamed local tensions within Yemen. Uh, where the Saudis have perhaps taken a step back, the Houthis have expanded their offensive. And uh, in both cases, the, the real one to suffer is the Yemeni civilians who uh, have uh, nobody who's able to intervene because of the borders are closed and because of the difficulty getting to them and tracking humanitarian aid is, is only inflamed uh, the policy. So US policy has shifted and it's been much to the detriment of the Yemeni civilians and to the Yemen conflict, which has uh, only gotten far worse in the past few months. Thank you. We have a couple of questions relating to uh, to domestic affairs. So, the, so the first is: are, are are the Houthis gaining broad popular support in Yemen? Um, and would it be realistic to expect uh, in the future a a, a unified, uh, uh, you know, fully unified state in Yemen? So that's where history like plays in again. Now, uh, in 1990, uh, 
North, uh, there was a North in South Yemen. Uh, few realized that South Yemen was the first and only Arab communist state. It was a Marxist state, uh, not something you normally associate with the Middle East, but it was, certainly was the case in, in, it was a failed experiment in most regards. Uh, but in 1990, there's a unification of Yemen. Uh, many uh, will mistakenly call this a reunification of Yemen, but in reality, Yemen had never been unified. The Yemen that we see today in a map never existed in uh, history of antiquity. I think one would have to go back uh, maybe eight, 800 years to find a, a border uh, similar to the Yemen of today in the Rasulid dynasty. Uh, but Yemen has never existed as, as, as unified. But uh, So it's a very difficult unity, one that happened partially because the Soviet Union collapsed and South Yemen as a Marxist state collapsed because it lost its patron. And the unification with the North was seen as something that was economically and politically expedient at the time. Uh, it suffered another civil war in 1994, so it was a very difficult unity. Uh, so the Houthis themselves, when um, uh, when the Houthis first came to Sana'a in 2014, uh, part of, of the vision was to create two, not separate Yemens, but two autonomous Yemeni regions within a unified Yemen. There would be a North Yemen that would be controlled by this, the Houthis, and a South Yemen that would be controlled by Southern separatists, today known as the Southern Transitional Council. Uh, this obviously would have excluded the Yemeni internationally recognized government, uh, which right now is sitting in 50 hotel rooms in Riyadh. So there's very lit little uh, legitimacy for the internationally recognized government. Uh, even though all of the ambassadorial positions are held by this government, uh, even though all of the international players and humanitarian aid goes through the Riyadh-based government, it has little legitimacy, if any, in, in Yemen itself. So the Houthis are really the only uh, governing body in North Yemen in that area that we saw on the map. Uh, so yes, the Houthis are uh, extremely corrupt in their own ways and have a very dictatorial stance towards their country, especially towards minorities. Uh, but yet this is the only government that the North knows. And ironically, Sana'a, the capital city, is relatively stable despite all of the uh, warring. Uh, there is uh, a degree of electricity even for four hours a day. Uh, there's some kind of civil service sector that has emerged. Uh, so all that Yemenis, especially those living in the north, know is the Houthis. Uh, and it's uh, impossible to see in any event the Yemeni government returning from its hotel rooms in Riyadh to a triumphant return to the capital city of Sana'a, taking over the country and reunifying in some grand bargain. Uh, this can't happen anymore. And the Houthis have entrenched themselves in such a way into Yemeni politics that they can never be removed again uh, and can't be remarginalized as they had been for the previous decades. So this was certainly not the outcome that people envisioned in 2014, but it's certainly one that uh, can never be separated again from Yemeni politics. So the Houthis have become very much a part and, and symbolic of what Yemen is and can uh, be taken out of that scene again. Thank you. you. You've mentioned the Houthis' racism, and that ties into the next question, uh, asking you to comment on on the minority communities in Yemen, such as the the Jewish community. Uh, this has gotten a great deal. It is a great question. Um, thank you for uh, for answering that, uh, for asking that, because uh, this has gotten a lot of media attention recently. Uh, Yemen historically, and I cover this in the book as well. Uh, the Jewish community in Yemen has a long history of. Uh, of prosperity in, in South Arabia. If uh, one would, would think about a symbol of Yemen outside of uh, spices, agriculture, uh, coffee, and maybe poetry in the Southern Yemeni port city of Aden, the other symbol would probably be the uh, beautiful silver, silver jewelry that symbolized Yemen for hundreds of years. Uh, and this was the, the product of a lot of the Jewish silversmiths who had a monopoly over this, uh, over this artisanry. Uh, and uh, the numbers of, of Jews at their height uh, probably maxed at around 50 to 60,000 Jews living in Yemen. Uh, but many of the, the trades and, and a lot of the Yemeni culture uh, was with this community. And the great majority left between 1948 and 1951 uh, as part of what was known as Operation Magic Carpet, uh, the great majority of whom moved to uh, Israel. The Jews who were living in the southern Yemeni port city of Aden moved to the UK. Uh, some of them uh, moved to Israel as well. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the 
by the 1960s, there were only about a, maybe between one and 2,000 Jews left in Yemen. Many of them were marginalized in the northern regions of the country. Uh, and that number has dwindled over the, the decades, uh, especially during the 1990s, as many of them began to leave. Uh, and uh, there was a moment in, in 2014-15 where the Houthis arrive in Sana'a, where the last uh, 100 Jews of, of Yemen were left, uh, and they see these chants outside, uh, cursed be the Jews, a death to America, death to Israel. Uh, so the leader of the Jewish community met with uh, the uh, Abdul Malik al Houthi, who was the head of the Houthi community, and said, well, should we be concerned for our safety? Your, uh, your, your slogan is obviously targeting us. Should, should we leave? Uh, and it, Part of the agreement was that you, know, you can stay and we'll ensure your safety as part of a tribal agreement. In fact, the great majority of the Jews have been safe. Uh, there's a few of them who are still sitting in, in jail, but uh, through various means or another, some of them clandestine, the great majority of whom have left. Uh, there's only a, a handful uh, of Jews left in Yemen. So it was once a, a, a very uh, a deep uh, historical uh, uh, group of uh, of, uh, of Jews' uh, community in Yemen is, is largely gone and extinct. Uh, and part of that is really that Houthi uh, antagonism against minorities. Now, it's not just the Jews, but there was a historic Christian community in Yemen. Uh, until recently, one could still find uh, churches in, in Aden uh, and uh, services that one could find in Sana'a and elsewhere in the country. Uh, and those are largely gone. There was a Southern Baptist hospital in a region of Jujibla, uh, Southern region out south of, of Sana'a uh, that was attacked in 2000 and, um, and uh, in 2002 by a group of militants and uh, the Southern Baptists have largely left the country. Uh, and uh, the Houthis have made it even more difficult for minorities to practice openly. In fact, have banned it entirely. Uh, the same also goes for the Baha'is who had a a growing community within Yemen uh, and have also been forced to leave. So uh, the uh, there is a, a homogenous community emerging in Yemen that a lot of that diversity that had made Yemeni culture so rich has really been uh, removed from, from Yemen, uh, especially under the Houthis in the past few years. Thank you. Uh, the next question asks um, uh, about the role of Yemeni women in bringing peace to the country and the role of poets. Uh, didn't a, a woman, the questioner, ask win a Nobel Prize for her work in peace in Yemen some years ago? And, and do, does this does this work continue? Uh, thank you, Mary, for asking that question. Uh, you're referencing Tawakul Karaman, who's a good friend, uh, who uh, visits uh, the um, Kennedy School a lot. Uh, you know, we'd cross paths a bunch, but, but I've seen her around um, uh, around Yemen, around the world, and she is very outspoken. Uh, she did win the, the Nobel Peace Prize, I believe, was the first Yemeni to do so, uh, and was a champion for women's rights and participation, uh, gained her fame in the Arab Spring protests of 2011 and 2012. Uh, at the same time, Tawakul has been largely ostracized from the Yemeni political sphere because of her uh, conflicts with the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and uh, has largely been uh, pushed out of, of mainstream Yemeni uh, politics. In fact, her sister, Safa, uh, it was the first Yemeni to graduate from Harvard Law School. Uh, and, and her and I worked together on, on a number of uh, Yemen-related issues. Uh, and it's not just the two of them from the single family, but it's uh, dozens of Yemeni women are at the forefront, not just of bringing peace to the country, but I think more importantly, constructing a civil society in Yemen, something that has been largely absent uh, beforehand, but constructing a grassroots development within uh, Yemen. And a, a panel that I uh, hosted a, uh, a few weeks ago uh, was specifically focusing on a number of, of Yemeni women who've risen to uh, leadership positions within the civil society organization. Uh, and and this, they're more numerous, uh, uh, by by the day, if, if Yemeni women in particular leading this civil society development. So uh, the irony, though, is is that in 2012, the United Nations uh, special envoy, a man named Jamal Ben Omar, negotiated uh, this uh, national dialogue conference within Yemen, trying to envision a new role for women within society. And uh, there was a new law that had been passed that every delegation, Yemeni delegation or national committee needs a minimum of 30% women within the committee. This lasted for about a week uh, before 
uh, women were pushed out of public life to the extent where the uh, recent negotiations in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, hosted by the United Nations, uh, they were Yemeni negotiations, had not a single woman in the delegation. Uh, the the uh, real tragedy is the fact that although Yemeni women are extremely talented and are at the forefront of developing a civil society within Yemen, their public face is largely absent. Uh, and that's uh, both a combination of, of Yemeni culture, uh, Yemeni uh, religious practices, uh, but also a patriarchal society that has made it very difficult for women to rise up in the political sphere uh, and have been in some ways uh, relegated almost to developing grassroots rather than uh, top-down uh, development within Yemen. A question about uh, Yemen's army and where it stands in the current political landscape of the country. Uh, so the Yemeni army is, is an interesting uh, piece because uh, there used to be one national army and a lot of that was led by Ali Abdullah Saleh. Uh, and he had something known as a Republican Guard, uh, which was the elite forces armed uh, many ways by Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they were the kingmakers within Yemen. Uh, they had allied themselves with uh, the Houthi movement, which is one of the reasons why the Houthis were so successful. His large segments of the Yemeni army split off from the Republic and joined the Houthi movement. Uh, largely at the behest of the deposed president, Ali Abdullah Saleh. After his death in December of 2017, uh, that segment of the Yemeni army has largely dissipated and has broken up into various different militant groups, uh, some allied with uh, tribal leaders, uh, others allied with uh, Emiratis uh, or other patrons uh, along. So there, there really is no Yemeni army per se anymore. The Yemeni army is fragmented, uh, there's certainly no national army. Uh, and the great irony in all of this is that uh, in the South, where the Republic still holds some sway uh, is uh, and calls uh, their army, uh, the coalition armies, the coalition forces. The coalition forces are not made up of a Yemeni army. The coalition forces are made up of Emirati mercenaries, Saudi mercenaries, uh, and groups of uh, southern separatists who ally themselves with the uh, deposed uh, republic, uh, and groups of uh, militants, uh, Islamist militants, who found it expedient to ally themselves with the deposed uh, government in Riyadh uh, and try to seize territory in, in the southern half of, of Yemen. So that's a great question because there is no Yemeni national army anymore. The republic has lost its legitimacy, and after in 2017, the remnants of the Republican Guard or the army that had still been uh, together have disbanded and have uh, gone on to uh, join various different tribal alliances and groups uh, to the point where Yemen has fragmented militarily and politically uh, to the state where today there, there is no central group. In fact, the only, uh, in some irony, the only Yemeni military is probably the Houthi tribal military, which is the most centralized governing and military structure, uh, something that the uh, Saudis and, and the Republic had not assumed could happen, but in fact did happen uh, to a great extent as, as the Houthis have consolidated military forces and politics have become sovereigns in Northern Yemen. Thank you. If, and if you'll allow me to ask one uh, closing question, uh, if, if, if we were to come back here five, five years from now, um, what would be a best case scenario for the for the situ realistic uh, best case scenario for the situation in, in Yemen? So uh, in, in our, uh, I like to call this the Canadian solution. Uh, and the Canadian solution, not because uh, Lester Pearson's uh, peacekeepers are gonna be resuscitated and go out to Yemen and take care of it, although that is a part of it. Uh, and, and that really is uh, back, if, if you look at history in the 1960s, the most successful thing that the UN did during a civil war in Yemen during the 60s was to create a 20 square kilometer buffer zone between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And in fact, it was the Canadian Royal Air Force that oversaw this uh, demilitarized zone between the two countries. I think ultimately this is what's going to need to happen between the two countries so that the Saudis can withdraw from this conflict without feeling that their southern border is insecure. In terms of Yemen itself, uh, and this is also where the Canadian solution comes in, uh, is uh, finding a way to divide Yemen into a federalist system, very much in the Canadian model, where there's a great de degree of auto and autonomy in the various different 
uh, sectors and, and specifically three sectors that uh, the northern region dominated by by the Houthis and in other parties, uh, the southern region dominated by the Southern Transitional Council, and then an eastern region uh, of an area called Hadramaut, uh, which is a largely desert region, uh, but is one that has enjoyed a great deal of autonomy throughout the history of, of Southern South Arabia. So I think in five years, what we're going to eventually find is a Yemen divided into three distinct uh, provinces uh, s uh, united by a weak central government in Sana'a, uh, but ultimately one that has stays together uh, with a great degree of regional autonomy uh, and a very tense peace, uh, but nonetheless one that would be best for the future of Yemen. Thank you very much. Th thank you to all of the uh, uh, participants in the audience for, uh, for joining us uh, this evening. Charmaine, if you have any closing uh, comments. No, oh, this was so fascinating. Thank you so much, Asha and Casey Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us today. I wanted to, to mention, I don't think I had thought about mentioning this earlier, but Asha, you were part of the Horace W. Goldsmith class um, scholars program at Macaulay. And I know that helped you um, continue on to your um, graduate degree and studying um, the Middle Eastern. So, um, you know, we would love to have you back here. I know this is a conversation that can just continue on. I know I was like really hooked and listening very intently. So I would definitely extend that invitation to both of you. Hopefully you'll return um, with us at Macaulay. But thank you to the attendees. Thank you for joining us tonight. And we look forward for you returning to another program. We have another Macaulay Author Series coming up June 8th, and hopefully you can join us then as well. Thank you both so much, and have a great night, everyone. Thank you, Charmaine. Thank you, Thank Professor you. Johnson.